I thank you very much for this opportunity. Now let's see, yeah, they actually have it up here. I am going to go through a lot of stuff very fast, the whole point being to try to set the stage for what is the importance for this whole area. Uh, I'm going to, a term we use in this business is ICI, Institutional Commercial Industrial. With that, what I want, uh, this is a long laundry list of things to talk about, but these are the things that make things happen in this sector. It is a sector that bases everything on the bottom line. We had some talk about the rising cost of water. Here's an interesting quote coming from the chief executive, Dow Chemical. Water is the oil of the 21st century. Well, what are we talking about here? You saw this. This is showing areas of water stress in the world. And you notice there's a lot of brown and yellow in the United States. I just got back from New York where they kicked off a big water conservation program. This is a place that's supposed to have bukus of water, but it's the cost that is driving it. In fact, look at this graph. This, if I can get it right, this is the inflation rate for electricity. This is it for natural gas. This is water and wastewater and how fast it's been going up. It is the fastest growing cost of any water utility out there. I mean, of any utility that we use out there in the commercial and industrial sector. 2.8 times faster than electricity. Wow. This is going to impact all of us. And if you think uh, it all has to do with the supply of water, forget it. It has to do with infrastructure. Laura, thank you. She, I guess, stepped out. But anyway, uh, she talked about some of this. There, the Mayor Manuel's doubling water rates in Chicago. Why? Things are old there, and they have stormwater rules we don't have to deal with here, thank goodness. It's not a water supply issue. It's an infrastructure problem. In fact, the American Society of Civil Engineers gives water and wastewater infrastructure the lowest grade it gives anything. A lot lower than bridges, airports, and roads. Wow. We've got a long way to go. Here you go. Look at this. Age of pipes in our system. In fact, Kent, I believe uh, in your, uh, the pipe in front of your house was installed in 1928, I believe, here in Austin. Does that tell you something? These things have a life to them, and then they're no longer useful. All over the United States, and I'll show you an example in San Francisco, some neat stuff they're doing to take care of old infrastructure. And here's what this means to us in the future. Right now, if you have an old, you know, if you're talking water conservation, you've got to get toiletology worked in somewhere. <laughs> okay, right now, if you have a five gallon flush toilet, it's costing you 4.9 cents every time you flush. 20 years from now, at the current historic rate over the last 25 years, a 5.85% uh, inflation for water and wastewater utilities, it's going to cost you 15 cents to go to the potty. Now think if you are a school or an office building and how many people are there, that's a bunch of money on the bottom line. This is where I'm coming from on a lot of this stuff. And don't forget, we have a lot of other costs out there. If you look at just the cost, we talk about the energy water nexus, just the cost to the inner, uh, water needed to make energy and the energy needed to treat water and wastewater and pump it around, it's about 3% of the total national thing. If you add in heating water and making steam, EPA estimates it at 12%. Wow, that's huge. A lot of other hidden costs. So now, number one, this session, what I just got through with, the way to take it away, and it's been said several times here, the cheapest water you'll ever have is the water you already have. Water efficiency is the cheapest source of water. We, uh, we had the pie up here earlier that showed that a third would come from new water supplies, a third from moving water supplies around, and a third from conservation. And conservation was the cheapest. So how do we use water here in Texas? Uh, I'm going to give you a test. Uh, in, in the typical Texas city, what percent of total residential use is for outdoor use? Is it, uh, hold, uh, hold up your hand when you think I'm right, 10%? 20%, 30%, 40%, 
50%, more than 50%. Okay, we're gonna look at all this stuff here. First place, you saw this graph. I put it together a little bit differently because I included the industrial and the manufacturing components in here. In the very near future, uh, ag will become the lower use, it won't be that 50 and 60, 70, 80% back in the 80s, it was 80%. It's going to be that urban and industrial water use. That's where the money is going to. And we talked about the shortages, there are your shortages there up to eight and a half million acre feet. Yeah, we've got some challenges out there. If you read the 2012 Texas Water Plan, uh, and I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna read this to you, I'll let you read that yourself. That's an astounding statement. We have our work cut out for us because we don't, are not gonna have enough during a drought. What do we do? Again, here's how we use it. If you take a look at just the residential use, this was a study based on 259 cities done by the Texas Water Development Board, and they came up with residential outdoor use that averages 31% of total annual residential use. 31%, that's probably a lot lower than, I saw a lot of right hands out here, by the way, but uh, wow, think about that. That's What happens, though, is in the middle of summer in August here, and then uh, actually in July out a little further west, there we peak at different times because of climatic things here, 70% of your production, of your water you're serving on a really hot day in August is for outdoor use. So you have all that infrastructure sitting around uh, doing nothing for you 75% of the time. Okay, enough of that. This is just a map you can download the report and look at it showing you where these cities are and how much they use. But here's another one of all the water that a municipalities distribute in the state of Texas, 16.8% loss. And they figure that right at 14%, part of that's meter error, but about 14% of it is real water that got away from the system. Now, if General Motors had 14% of its automobiles fall off the trains that were delivering new cars, yeah, you get the idea, okay. This is based on an analysis uh, of 586 cities in the state of Texas. This is how water is really used, supplied by the municipalities. Whoops, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself here. You notice that for some reason, that should, that, this should read uh, residential leaks, that should read system leaks, residential irrigation, commercial irrigation. So if you put these together, commercial, uh, think 20, 20, 30, 30, 20%, uh, actually it's 21% irrigation, 19% leak loss, 30% commercial, institutional, uh, self-supplied industrial, and 30% residential. Now that's probably a graph you've never seen before. Straight from Texas Water Development Board data, totally approved by what they, they do. Okay, but we, most of our industries are self-supplied. So when you put that picture in here, you get something very, very different. You'll notice there that all of a sudden, this leak, I don't, why did that do that, I wonder on, it worked just fine on my computer. Okay, uh, this is your residential, this is your residential, your indoor, outdoor, uh, re residential leak loss, system leak loss. If you look out here and add it up, the biggest single use out there isn't residential, it's the, the ICI, Institutional Commercial Industrial Use, 55% of the total water use. Now, think of, think of the water conservation. How many of you have heard anybody on television talking about water conservation ever talk about that, the 55% of the water use? They generally uh, talk about irrigation. If you look at research, there's this huge amount of wonderful research going on on agricultural water conservation. The panel before lunch was a classic example of that very important stuff. Also, many of our schools are doing great stuff on landscape irrigation. Well, outside of the ag area, if you look at the non-ag area, they're addressing the 20%. I wanna talk about the 80%. We need a lot of stuff going on there, I guarantee you. So keeping on, here is one example. And I call this the energy water nexus of the end user. How do we, 
How many of you, how many of you have actually gone out and looked at a cooling tower? Okay, good. You know, they're a wonderful piece of equipment and, and a lot of things to do. But here's how we really use water. This is real measured, metered water use. 11 office buildings in downtown Austin, 53% cooling towers. There it is for hospitals. Uh, again, that's 63, uh, 50, 43% cooling towers. Here it is for a bunch of audits we did. Are you seeing a lot of red on here? That's all cooling tower use. And here's how we use it in manufacturing. Uh, there's blue on that one, I'm sorry. Uh, wow. A huge amount of our water that we use in the ICI sector is for cooling. And there, we have a lot of better ways of getting onto it. And what is the impact? Why do you use cooling towers in an air conditioning system? It's because you save money on energy. You save three to four cents per ton hour. And uh, University of Texas has many thousands of tons of installed capacity. It's important. But for every time you use one ton hour, uses about right at two gallons of water. Depends on how efficiently you're using it. You remember that chart on the toilets? Well, the same thing is happening right now. If you look at this, the yellow is how much you save on energy. At current rates, if you get a evap credit more than you want to go into here, that's kind of the range of what it would be for water cost. If you go out 20 years from now, all of a sudden, the water is costing more than the energy you save. This has some dire consequences. If we go back to all air-cooled stuff, we're going to up energy use, the greenhouse gas, and all this good stuff. We need research in this area, looking at geothermal systems and a whole bunch of other things. We're not getting there. I could say the same thing as you look at buildings, inside the buildings, commercial kitchens, office buildings, laboratories, hospitals. There's a huge amount of technology that is available. And it's there. We just got to get it in place. Finally, we have a lot of other things to take a look at here. And the municipal, uh, you know, Texas is, Texas lead, uh, only two states get an A from the Texas, uh, uh, from the America, uh, from the Alliance for Water Efficiency, a national organization that rates as Texas and California. We have uh, now reporting that's going to be done by type of user, commercial, institutional, single family, multifamily, industrial. We have stuff out there that says uh, if you have to report your water loss, not only to the state each year, but to the individual customer. We have stuff going on uh, to ca catch data on state-supported facilities through uh, SB 700. New technology out there, portfolio manager, which can be used to benchmark water use for the ICI sector. A uh, whole different topic I could spend a long time on. Financial aids. Nobody mentioned PACE here. It is a just passed by the legislature, will start coming online later this year, a funding mechanism in the private sector for uh, th those types of things. And I could go on down all kind of codes and things like this that we have. The bottom line, I'll just show you. I'll give you one example here, on-site sources. The University of Texas collects all kinds of stuff. It collects rainwater, uh, it collects AC condensate, uh, it collects some stuff from swimming pools, et cetera. 135,000 gallons of water a day are being used. Yet in the state of Texas, we have very archaic gray water rules. Great rainwater harvesting. San Francisco found itself in a, uh, between a rock and a hard spot with old pipes downtown that could not supply right after the war. They built for five-story buildings, and now they have 50-story buildings. They're paying people to use non-potable sources there. Same thing in Tokyo. I could go on and on. But I have to say this, we need, we do not want to decrease the amount of, air, of research and information and stuff that's going on in the ag sector and the landscape irrigation. But we also need to look at this whole ICI area and all these other things too. It's very important. With that, I thank you. And I'm gonna sit down and listen to these other guys. <laughs> And I got through one minute late. <laughs>